literally anything. We got pantyhose, tree branch, Hello Kitty comb. I don't know why I have that. <laughs> Yarn, palette knife, all kinds of brushes, clay sponge, the works. We're going to have fun today. Let's start out with the most basic tool of all, which is the brush. Because I think for a lot of people, sometimes a brush can feel, for lack of a better word, a little bit boring <laughs> for some people. I mean, when you've got funky tools like kosher salt sitting around, I can see that. But don't underestimate what you can do with the brush. So I'm going to show you a couple of fancy little tricks that you can do with acrylic painting that are really fun. And I do recommend really spend time with your big brushes. You, you guys think the little brush is your friend. It's totally going to stab you in the back. Learn how to use your big brushes. And what I would just do, first of all, I think it's really good anytime you paint, just have a scrap sheet of paper so you can warm up a little bit. And just sometimes when I paint with acrylics, I really want to know, okay, how much paint is actually in my brush? Because that does very much affect how I can do it. So I'm just trying to see, okay, I've got some paint. It's not super thick. Okay. So the first thing that I would say for you guys to think about is, do you want to show your stroke? So for example, if I take a lot of paint and I do something like that, does everybody see how this has a very deliberate movement to it? It's going somewhere. And if I do something like this, and I do shorter strokes like that, that's a very flat way to use the acrylic. And this is more coloring in a particular shape, whereas this shows the movement. So I would say if you have not had the opportunity to make brush strokes that really show a specific direction for what you're trying to do, do it. It's gonna change your life as an abstract painter, as a representational painter, that's all very important. So if I take this and I do something like that, if I go in that direction, now it feels very much like there's much more of a conversation that's happening in this canvas panel. All right, we're gonna fill up a lot of canvas panels today. Guess who spent um, way too much money at the art supply store yesterday? Oh my God, I was horrified. <laughs> by how much all this cost. Okay, let's do another one, but let's play with the stroke so that it changes language. And so one exercise that I have shown a lot of people in the past is doing vertical strokes. So if you just do every old boring stroke, that's pretty straightforward. But if you think about it like this, like if you start, for example, very, very light, and then you press down hard, and then you get light again, and do something like that. This is very heavy pressure. This is very little, almost nothing. And then I come back. So let's try another one that's like barely there. It's still, again, it's gonna be a single stroke, but something like that, which is very light and feathery can be super fun. Or you can do something that really feels fast. So let's do that. Something like that, which has a certain rhythm and speed which is very different than this, or you could do something more like that, which feels a little bit more slippery. Sort of makes me think a little bit about squid. Remember, I would love for all of you to paint along with me in any media. Acrylic is better, but if you only have oil or water mixables, that's totally fine. And I would love for you all to post what you make in the Discord in the Art Alongs channel, because my goal for today is to make a visual dictionary of marks. And we're gonna label all of them so that way we know exactly what is what. So up here, I'm just gonna write brush. Because it just occurred to me that oftentimes I'll do these demonstrations, but I never keep track of what is what. <laughs> and so you oftentimes you go back and you look at all these strokes and you're like, how did I make that? And so my thought is that we can do that together today. 
Okay, so that first one was brush. This one is also brush. And of course, there are many different types of brushes that you can use, like this fan brush, which Kathy Speranza got me very excited about, is really, really fun. So let me show you guys what to do. Now, in terms of acrylic, if you've never used it before, it is very important that if you have brushes and you're not using them for a little while, put them in the water. Because if they sit out and you forget, which is really easy to do, if the acrylic paint dries into your brush, that brush is gone. Say goodbye, <laughs> which I have done on many occasions. Tell me in the chat, who has ruined their brushes out of stupidity. <laughs> Me, <laughs> absolutely. Not because I was being irresponsible, but just I was being stupid. <laughs> That's a very different thing. Okay, let's see what the fan brush does. So my first instinct for a fan brush is to use it very thin, okay? So for example, making these strokes like this. I feel like that would be really good for painting birds or something that has a lot of texture to it. I'm gonna zoom in more so you can all see that a little bit more. So now let's increase just a little bit the quantity of paint. And now let's really blob it on and see what the fan brush does. Yeah. Or actually you can even do stuff like this. Like if you wanna take the fan brush, let me work out a little bit more of that paint and just like press it in. You can definitely get really cool strokes like that. Or if you want to stipple it, weird. This looks like mascara. <laughs> That's really fun. And then if you don't want to show the shape of the fan brush, you can obviously do something more like this, where maybe you're going in all different directions and you can make something that's much softer. And bear in mind, we haven't even gotten to the water yet. <laughs> this is just straight acrylic paint. There's so many techniques I have to go over with all of you today. So you, you better get ready for some serious playtime. Seven Angelic says, there is a cleaner from Windsor & Newton that will take fully dried acrylic off ruined brushes. Really? I did not know that. I'm gonna have to ask Windsor & Newton about all that stuff. Let me know in the chat who here is going to paint along with me because really you cannot go wrong <laughs> with today's paint along. Okay, so this is the fan brush. Let's label that. And again, I'm gonna put my fan brush in the water. Let's get another canvas board. And I think what I would like to demo next is glazing because Glazing is basically transparent paint. I gotta see if, oh, this is not dry. Okay, let me wait for that to dry before I do the glazing. But another thing you can do is just stippling. So basically what we did with the fan brush, except you're doing it with just a regular brush. This is a filbert shaped brush. This one is a flat and you can see that their shapes are very different. It's up to you. There's no correct brush to use. I happen to like the filberts a lot better. I'm not as big of a fan of the flats. That's my personal preference. But I think the important thing about stippling is you have a couple factors. You have how much paint is in the brush and you also have how much physical pressure are you applying? So if I take this and I press like really hard, are you angry about anything? Now's the time to do it. <laughs> or you can make it really, really thin. So if I just take my brush and I just try to work out a lot and I like barely put any pressure. I mean, that's me hardly even touching the surface of the canvas. So it's a lot of factors and you can also do gradients. For example, if you wanted to make that really hard and then you could increasingly use less and less pressure to create a gradient like this. I mean, this is time consuming. This is if you really are a patient person, which I am not. 
but you can see that's really fun where you can really get it to shift. And then other things like you don't always have to paint with the tip of the brush. I mean, you can totally just do this, like just press it down. And of course it's extremely unpredictable, but these marks are really, really fun. Okay, so this one, we're just gonna write a uh, filbert brush stippling. And what I'll do after the stream is I'll take some really good, clear close-ups so you can all really see exactly what this is going to look like. Now, the other thing, you don't even have to use a, quote, real brush. I mean, you guys can just save your old toothbrushes and paint with this. I mean, this is super fun and it's a very different motion. So let's take this. I mean, that's really fun. Ooh, that's cool. Did you guys see that? I mean, I am playing around as much as all of you are. I, I have never dipped a toothbrush into acrylic paint before. This is all new territory for me. That's interesting. That's a very different mark than the filbert. You can sort of see the rose. I'm gonna see if I can show the rose a little bit better. Like maybe if I, yeah, it's not that great, but it, it is still really cool. I'm gonna see if I can do more. Oh, that is a really cool mark. Let's try another one. What if I go like, ooh, that's really cool. Okay, I am liking the toothbrush. This is really cool. JD Corgan says, I love to add whitewashed paintings with old toothpaste. Oh my gosh, that is brilliant. Well, later on, I'm gonna demonstrate for all of you, I did bring some disposable pastry bags. We're gonna have a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so this is a toothbrush. Label that. And of course, we've got our old fashioned fingers, <laughs> which are definitely just as cool. So don't ignore what you can do with your fingers. Let's just get that in there. Well, that's actually very graphic. <laughs> I was not really expecting that to be the case. But again, if you wanna do more of a stippling effect, that's always really fun or something, let's really juice up there. That looks pretty good. <laughs> I always really enjoy making marks that change because oftentimes what I see is people have a tendency to make a mark that stays the same. And that's okay. I'm just saying that I myself, I'm fascinated when a mark starts very dark and then changes, or you can have a mark like this which is not doing much and then maybe does something like that. So it has a different rhythm. I mean, a lot of this is actually very similar to music in that this idea of pacing of a mark can be very, very helpful. So let's see what happens if I just, okay, that's kind of a boring mark. Oh, well, <laughs> you definitely want to have your fair share of paper towels. So we're just going to write here fingers like that. Oh, this is hilarious. Amusey says, I've used an electric toothbrush. It was really good for mixing paint. Oh, I've never even thought about that. Neil asks, is it deadly to touch cadmium paints with my bare fingers? Yeah, you don't want to do that. Thank you very much for bringing that up. This is not cadmium. I think what I just used, this is ultramarine blue. But yeah, if it's pure cadmium, because there's a lot of cadmium, it's mostly filler. But I mean, just stay away from cadmium stuff. That's a really good point that I think is important for everybody to know. And JD Corgan says you could wear a rubber glove if you are using cadmium paints or other heavy metal paints. That is really smart. Thank you very much for that suggestion. <laughs> Natalie says, in a pinch, I love using broccoli for 
blending acrylics. <laughs> I would feel bad wasting the food. My parents were really uptight about food when I was a kid. I guess if it was like a rotten piece of broccoli, that would be okay. <laughs> Diva Thomas says, how many colors do you recommend using? Well, today we're just going to focus on collecting our vocabulary. This is a dictionary that we're making today. And then in May, Lauren and I are going to do a paint along where we're actually going to take all the techniques that we're showing you right now and we're going to actually make a painting. So we're not going to make a painting today but we're gonna give you the vocabulary that you need in order to make the painting. Okay, let's do some, let's see, what's on my list? I've got this really long list. <laughs> you guys see this? It's this long, long list of different textures that I wanna show you. Let me show you how to use matte medium. Because I think for a lot of people, when they want to paint with acrylics, they just use acrylics and water. And that's what I did. I mean, when I was in high school, I had no idea about matte medium or any of this stuff. I just got my acrylic paints, my brushes, my water, and I went. And that's fine. You can totally do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But matte medium makes a really big difference. Because what you do is you just put a little bit of it... <clears throat> onto your palette. And it basically is a way to loosen the flow of the paint without totally breaking it down. Because that's what happens with water. If you add water to the acrylic, it tends to really break down the acrylic. This retains the flow, but it also allows the paint to retain its body. Okay, I feel like I'm talking about hair products. But anyway, <laughs> let's do one with a lot of gel medium. So this one's like mostly gel medium. So you can see the different quantities. Okay, so this is a lot of gel medium with just a tiny bit of that. So I'm gonna make a little stroke here. You guys can see what that looks like. Okay, so I'm gonna just write here, um, this is matte medium and they have so many different kinds. So eat your heart out in terms of different brands. Matte medium. Okay. So now let's try another one, but let's add more paint into it so you can see what the difference is. Okay. So let me get, all right. So this is more like half and half. Now on the canvas, you may not actually feel, you may not actually see a big difference but a lot of matte medium and how it functions is how it feels in your brush. And that's something you really just have to experiment yourself because it's not really something I can explain to people. So let's just write here, less matte medium. And just as an experiment for comparison, let's do a stroke that is only water with the acrylic We'll paint it on the canvas, and I'm not sure you'll be able to see the difference on the live stream, but maybe later on I can take a photo. Okay, so this is just water that I've put here. But does everybody see how different this is? So the palette that I'm using, in a pinch, you can use freezer paper. And this is basically, it's just plastic coated paper like this. It's like the disposable palettes that you can buy at the supply store, except you can roll out like a huge sheet of it and it's way cheaper, okay? Let me zoom out so you can see the difference in the paint quality because it's pretty dramatic. Okay, does everybody see this is water with the acrylic paint? And now look at, let's get another brush. This is the matte medium, put out a little bit more. Just look at how different. Does everybody see how this stroke, it's like nice and, and smooth and the paint is like flowing? Down here with the water, the paint is not flowing. In fact, it's just all over the place. So that's the difference. Maybe it looks somewhat similar when you're actually on the canvas, but that is a huge difference in terms of water here 
and matte medium. Okay, so this is just straight water. I'm just gonna put this here. And you can see it's, it's not remotely the same application, okay? This just breaks down the acrylic paint in a totally different way. So it's just right here, water. A lot of people ask me things like, oh, well, what's the point of doing the matte medium? That's the point. That's a really big difference in terms of just the experience. So even if the visual doesn't necessarily have that dramatic of a difference, for me, the way a paint feels in my brush is a very important part of painting that physical interaction. Amanda says matte medium also increases transparency and is great for painting clouds and misty effects. Absolutely. Once that first panel dries, I'm going to show you how glazing works, which is transparent paint over opaque paint. And you will find that glazing is much better with matte medium. You can do water, you absolutely can, but the matte medium is just a lot better. W315 says, why matte medium? Why not gloss? Matte must be better on camera. I didn't think about that, but you're right, W315. I just happened to have it <laughs> in the house and I'm cheap and I did not want to go spend $3,000 at the art store. I did purchase some of these golden mediums that we're going to have a lot of fun with, like this coarse pumice gel, but oh my God, these are expensive. One of these is like $12. I was like, are you kidding? And they had like 30 different kinds. So I'm not going to buy all of them. But what I would say is that if you get into acrylic painting and you really want this to be part of your practice, look up the stuff that Golden makes. I mean, it's awesome. This is glass bead gel. This is heavy gel matte. And they basically have every single variation. So they have heavy gel matte, heavy gel gloss, light gloss matte gel. I mean, <laughs> I just made that up, but there's just so many different media that you can use. At a girl says, general guideline, medium, medium, it really depends. Like Seven Angelic explains, just depends on what texture you want it. You're not trying to add anything, just use regular medium. And that's why I think this little dictionary that we're making today is gonna to help all of you because I do get so many questions about this. And oftentimes it's hard to explain if you don't have something that's really visual that people can actually look at. Okay, let me put these on the floor. Oh boy, am I gonna make a mess today? <laughs> I can just tell. <laughs> Claudia says, can or should you use paint plus medium plus water? You can, it's fine. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that in terms of the chemical composition. My feeling is if you're using the matte medium, you don't really need the water. It's totally up to you. Okay, now, the printmaker in me is going to get very excited because you know what? I really think that printmaking should be more involved with painting. Like I used to teach a class at RISD that, I need a palette knife. It was called Painterly Prints and it was for painting majors so that way they could learn how to do printmaking to inform their studio practice. And it was wonderful. I'm so happy that they had that class. But I think what I see a lot is there are a lot of painters who, because they don't have that printmaking experience, it never occurs to them to do it. So I'm gonna show you all this printmaking stuff and you're gonna say, oh my goodness, why have I not <laughs> been incorporating this into my painting practice? So sponges, are super fun and try it with water and without water. So if I do this one, this is just straight acrylic. You can see it's pretty dry looking. Let me zoom in a little bit more so you can see the texture a little bit better. Okay. And obviously you can change the thickness of the paint. Like if you really want to like blob it on, you can totally do something more like that. Or you can also play with pressure. So if you're like hitting this thing, <laughs> you're really mad at somebody. And then of course, there's also the very, very light, thin atmospheric stuff 
that is barely there. And any sponge is game. I don't even know what this is. This is like a random piece of foam. I feel like I got it in a package. I don't know. This is a ceramics sponge. And actually, if any of you have ceramic supplies lying around, they're really good for this type of thing. So let's try this one. It's going to make a completely different shape. Yeah, very, very different. So actually, let's write this down <laughs> so we remember. So this is a ceramic sponge. And this is just a unknown sponge, <laughs> I guess is what I'm going to call it, because I don't even know this is sponge. Okay, so those are two different kinds of sponges, but that was with totally dry paint. Now let's add a little bit of water and see what happens. All right, so you could just dip this in, this is a little condiment container, and you can work some of it out on the palette. That's actually really not a bad idea because sometimes it can just make your painting like really wet, which you don't really want. That's weird, those look like amoebas. Don't they? I don't know that that texture is gonna stay though. It might disappear. It seems like it's just foamy bubbles. So maybe this will end up looking really flat. Looks really cool right now though. But maybe if I experiment with a larger quantity of paint that will help. So I do think that a lot of abstract painting is contingent upon sensitivity to the materials. And I think if you don't take the time to experiment like this, you won't develop that sensitivity. And so that's why I think this playtime <laughs> session is really, really helpful. And then remember, you don't have to always print it like this. I mean, you can take the sponge and do stuff like that. Almost like wiping. And so this is more like a glaze, what I'm doing here. So we're gonna write here again, <laughs> unknown sponge. <laughs> And you can see the addition of water really changes that effect. Oh, out a girl, now you're thinking steel wool. That would be awesome. And great point from Wilmy, who says, actually, you can use everything you can think of. As long as you're not hurting yourself or destroying something that somebody in your house maybe wants, you're probably going to be fine. Adam says, I buy the big car wash sponges and then rip them apart rather than cutting into them to help it from looking so contrived. That's a great idea. Yeah, because this sponge is very visibly a triangle and this one is such an obvious round shape. And sometimes, for lack of a better word, some of those sponges, they can look a little corny. I don't know. To me, they just look like bad Hallmark cards. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm being very judgmental, but for me, I, I'm not really a fan of that. Okay, so let's try the ceramic sponge, but this time let's put some water on it. Oh, that's really fun. I mean, that's really wet. And this is really cool because this is very soft and this is not. This has a speed to it and this has a direction to it as well. So I'm just gonna write here. Ceramic sponge plus water. And then of course, you can also come in here and just do something like this. I mean, that's why I'm a really big fan of doing exercises like this because when I'm trying to compose something, it gets overwhelming because I'm thinking about so many things. Like right now, I'm not thinking about composition. I'm not thinking about making a statement or does this look good? I'm just thinking about supplies, that's it. And I do think that that's a great way to work because sometimes it's not good to try to do eight different things all at the same time. Sometimes you just really wanna look at this and develop a sensitivity towards your materials. 
And Victor is saying, do you keep these sheets you've played on for future reference? I think I would. I mean, that's why I'm making them. <laughs> at, at the very least, I'm making them for all of you. So all of you will be able to do that. I'm not really an acrylic painter, so I don't spend a huge amount of time doing it. But some people who are, I think it would be very, very helpful. Okay, let's do one on the canvas because it is quite different when you use the canvas. Let's do saran wrap, okay? And actually any plastic, whatever, it could be a plastic bag, it could be sandwich bag, whatever you want, this will all work fine, okay? So the first thing that you can do, actually, let me show you on paper first because I don't wanna waste it. I know I'm such a frugal person when it comes to paint. Like I, I just, it bothers me to waste it. It's almost like, it's like food. When I was a kid, my parents were very uptight about wasting food. And so one of the things that they told me when I was a kid, because we ate rice almost every single day, they said, for every piece of rice that you leave on your bowl, you're gonna get a pock mark on your face. This is not a pimple, this is a pock mark. It's like an actual little valley in your face. They're scary looking. And to this day, I cannot leave one piece of rice. It bothers me. I'm compulsive about it. And I feel the same way about paint. Like I can't waste any of it. It just bothers me way too much. Jill, thank you so much for the super sticker. We so much appreciate your support. Every single contribution that all of you can make to Art Prof, it directly impacts what we can provide. So we greatly appreciate your support. There are two ways to do this saran wrap, okay? One way, and actually, you know, it might, uh, maybe you don't want the matte medium though, because actually with the printing, you probably want the paint to be a little bit thicker. So yeah, put this on fairly thick because if you don't have enough paint on it, number one, it might dry too quickly. And number two, ooh, you're not gonna get as dramatic of an impression. Okay, a little bit more like that. Okay, so now you take your saran wrap and you can do it however you want. I'm gonna have a section that's less busy and I'll have another section that's very busy so all of you can see the difference like this. And actually, this would work extremely well on jelly plates. So if some of you missed it, I did do this demonstration recently on how to do acrylic image transfers with jelly plates. And this would be great on a jelly plate. But what I'm trying to show you is that it doesn't have to be on a jelly plate. It could be on a sheet of paper or on some canvas. Okay, so let's rip that up. Oh, that is very satisfying. Okay. Let me go in a lot closer so you can see what we're really looking at. Does everybody see these little bits of wrinkles in there? I mean, to me, this is not really enough to be its own thing, but it's definitely a beginning. Okay, so this is painted acrylic plus saran wrap. And now the flip side of that, this is assuming you're fast enough, <laughs> you can take the piece that you just printed with, press this down, and let's see if that does something cool. I suspect it will. Okay, let's try it. Ooh, that is cool. Okay, I am really loving this texture. Much more dramatic than what you saw earlier. Let me just make a note here and I'm gonna dunk this in the water. All right, so this is saran wrap with printed acrylic. That's really cool. I'm gonna hold it up really close so all of you can see. 
Isn't that amazing? I mean, it really looks like a thumbprint, but cooler, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> Uel says, I use this type of technique with spray paint. Spray paint is fun. The only thing about spray paint is you do need to do it outdoors. And at least in the US, I think you have to be 18 to buy it. So I'm not demoing it because I don't want to do that in my office. And also for a lot of people, it's just not accessible. JD Corgan says, I have a sheet of canvas paper that I apply leftover paint on after a painting with different palette knives just to practice strokes. So no paint gets wasted. That's great. I love that idea. And I know people have done in the Discord paintings from the leftover paint palette, which is really cool because yes, it, it's just, it hurts me <laughs> to waste art supplies. Neil is asking, what's your opinion on acrylic pouring? I think it's cool looking. It's not my cup of tea. I think that it's somewhat of a fad right now there's a million instagram videos on acrylic pouring and i don't see it as being any different than what i'm doing today i think the difference is that it really has just caught on as something that's super popular on social media all right let's do some more printing Ooh, i knew that i saved all of this bubble wrap <laughs> for a good reason. <laughs> so let's try this with the blue. And I'm going to do the same thing that I did with the saran wrap. So that way you can all see what's going on. Uh, let me use this. So again, I'm going to paint it on fairly thick to make sure that I, I really do get the impression that I'm looking for. Press that in. Love bubble wrap. I wanted to find the little bubble wrap, but I couldn't find any. I mean, I moved to Utah a couple months ago, and the amount of packaging material we have is just obscene. I was a little surprised <laughs> that I couldn't find the little bubble wrap. Although, the big bubble wrap is just that much more satisfying to pop. The little bubble wrap doesn't do it for me. The big bubble wrap is kind of awesome. Okay, so let's take that off. Oh, and I need to label this. So this is acrylic painted plus printed bubble wrap. Okay, let's see what happens. Ooh. Same thing, it's not that dramatic, but it's definitely there. And if anything, a lot of what I'm showing you today, it's not that this is done, it's that this could be a starting point for something else. Okay, let me do another one really quickly because I wanna make sure that that bubble wrap doesn't dry before I print it. I mean, this is a more 3D material, so I'm not sure it's gonna pick up as much as the saran wrap did, but who knows? See. Yeah, not a lot came off. I mean, I suppose maybe if I'd used a little bit more paint, it would have worked better, but it's still an effect. And I know a lot of people say things to me like, well, I really don't know how to get started. I don't know where to find my inspiration. This can be your inspiration. This can be the beginning of a painting. You can say to yourself, how do I want to proceed from here? And that's a great way to not have to feel responsible for the starting stage. Okay, so this is um, acrylic on bubble wrap, printed. Now, another thing you can do as well, you don't have to rely just on the printing part. So for example, you could do it the other way around, which is instead of painting the paper, you paint the bubble wrap. Let's see what that looks like. All right. And here you, you do want to use a lot of paint because if you don't, it's not going to work out so well. Okay, so I'm just trying to get it everywhere. Just totally coat this thing. Actually, let's really, let's blob it on. 
Let's see. I'm going to pick a couple spots to do that. All right, let's get that on immediately. Yeah. Really try to press it. Okay, let's see. Ooh, that came out way better. And you know what you can do also? You can print what's called a ghost. A ghost is when you have a print, you print it once, like I did here, but then you can print it again. <laughs> this just never ends. Do you see why printmaking is so addictive? It's just like, once you start printing anything, you just, you don't want to stop. It's just really fun and satisfying. Oh, I like the ghost better. That's way better. Okay, so let's just write this down. Acrylic. Painted on bubble wrap. Ghost print. You know what? Let's do another ghost <laughs> because actually there's still quite a bit of paint on this. And it might be even more light, but maybe in a good way. Just don't know. So what I'm hoping to do is take photos of all of these and post a dictionary on artprof.org. Tell me in the chat, would you like me to do that? Would that help you as an artist? Oh, I like that one. That one's better. I like this one the best. Okay, so acrylic painted on bubble wrap, second ghost print. Wow, there's gonna be a big mess in my studio today. Mirta says, I use illustration board and glue Diverse sponge or things that do printmaking. Absolutely. If you're a printmaker, world is your oyster. <laughs> All right. I think you read my mind, JD Corrigan, because guess what we're going to do next? Aluminum foil. Okay. Let's do something similar. I'm going to crunch it up like this. And I'm going to paint it. We'll try some of the other stuff as well. Let's do the red because I'm curious. The value range is not quite as wide as it is in the black. I just want to see what that might look like. Okay. So I'm just going to paint like that. Plus, isn't this just so fun and mindless? <laughs> like, I'm not saying it doesn't take skill or focus to do something like this, but it's just a different muscle. It's doing another set of stretches. I feel like I'm at the gym doing my sit-ups, except it's way more fun and I'm not as sweaty or in as much pain. So I will take this any day of the week. Okay, let's try this. I'm not going to press too hard because I guess I worry with the aluminum foil, if I press too hard, it might make it too flat. And I like the three-dimensional quality of that. Let's try this. Oh, that didn't print very well, did it? You know what I'm gonna try? I'm gonna try putting a little water on it. Let's just see what happens. Okay, um, aluminum foil. Acrylic painted on. I'm just curious if maybe a little bit of water would loosen it because this is pretty graphic. A little bit of housekeeping here. Oh, there's green all over this. I think I need to get another brush. Okay, so let's just take some water. I'm just gonna spread it around a little bit. I'm not gonna put it everywhere. Just in a few spots where I think it might do some interesting things. And I'm gonna spread it to some spots that didn't have anything on it. 
I'm just curious. I mean, maybe nothing will happen. So much of this is just, hmm, that would be kind of cool. Let's just try it. <laughs> okay. Maybe I should press harder. <laughs> I think I was a little bit conservative last time. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Ooh, that's kind of cool. I don't know what it's gonna look like when it dries, but I do think it's a very different look than what we saw earlier. Does everybody see how graphic that looks? Okay, so aluminum foil. Painted with acrylic plus water. Okay, so let's just try one more with the aluminum foil, except this time I'm gonna actually paint onto the paper and we'll see how that comes out. Get more brushes. All right, so this I'm gonna I'm gonna put it on pretty thick. Oh jeez, I cannot believe how quickly you can go through acrylic paint. I think that for me at least, that is one advantage of painting representationally. The, the way I paint representationally is pretty thin. I don't use a lot of paint. And a lot of abstract painters I know do a lot of work that's very thick and I just look at it and go oh my god it hurts me to think about how much it must cost the supplies okay let's try this and this I'm really going to press hard because I really want to lift as much in fact I wonder what would happen if I put a brayer over this I'm going to put a brayer on half the side so this is brayer this is not brayer see what happens. Okay. Ooh. Maybe you shouldn't press too hard. This is actually a little bit hard to lift. Ooh. That is really cool though. And you know something, you can even see the streak of the brush. So acrylic. Aluminum foil, paper. Printed. And then, because we're here, we're gonna have to print the other sheet, which was here. I mean, this is very satisfying, especially if you're somebody who takes a long time on your pieces. It's just, it feels good to do something that is just fast. Tell me in the chat, for those of you who work on long-term pieces that take forever, do you ever crave the feeling to just get something done? <laughs> this, this I think does fulfill that. Oh, this dried too fast. All right, this is just a little something, but it's actually pretty cool. All right, so this is, printed aluminum foil. I like that. Vishaka is asking, which brush are you using? I love how long it is. The brushes I'm using, this is from Windsor and Newton. So this is artist oil brush. Of course, I'm using it for acrylic, <laughs> flat, and it's a number 12. And by the way, if any of you want information about the art supplies, those links are in their YouTube video description below, and you can look up the exact supplies that I'm showing in this stream. All right, it's time to do something with string. <laughs> So we're going to get some yarn and you can play with all different kinds of string. Obviously there's a million different kinds of string, but I thought it would be fun to have this yarn and also twine. I think it's really fun because it's coarser 
and therefore it's going to make marks that are a lot more dramatic compared to this yarn over here. And I'm sure there are 5 billion videos online <laughs> about how to paint with string. I'm just gonna show some of you a few options and then you can eat your heart out. <laughs> really, I think what this stream is more about is exposure. Just saying, hey, have you tried this? If you haven't, try it. <laughs> because ultimately, I think all of you, you're gonna make your own images. You're gonna come up with your own technique. Okay, so what you can do is press it in there, press it down like this, and then it's like you can play with that mark a little bit more. Or if you want to just take this, and you can see I am like spreading out the acrylic flat because you don't want to like dunk this in a gigantic blob of acrylic. I mean, you could, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying if you want the string texture to be more visible, that is helpful. I mean, ugh, this is a mess. So you can see I'm not doing it in a very predictable manner, but I don't think that matters. I, I think you can do it however you want. I mean, you could even just take the string and just roll it around and just press it. Or you can just, I mean, just do this. <laughs> I actually think this is a little bit more fun. If you take a small piece, you really can just roll this around in the acrylic paint like this and then just like use this to make marks. Press it around like that. Let me do a better one with the twine because the twine I think is a little bit more dramatic than the yarn. Oh dear, this is the most impressive mess I have ever made <laughs> for a live stream. And that's saying a lot. I mean, I thought the jelly plate tutorial was a mess. This is three times the mess. Okay, so let me press this down. Like that is a beautiful mark. I love that. And I think I've seen stuff where people like whip the paper and, and all kinds of other things you can do. So just play around with it. And it's the same thing with the printing. You can print with the string as well. A lot of things that you can do. Victor says, I personally would combine multiple techniques so it feels more like fine art than arts and crafts. No hate on arts and crafts though. What I would say in response to that, Victor, is that I think people are very quick to categorize things. And I think categorizing things, it's hard because there are a lot of things that are hard to categorize or that feel that they belong in multiple categories. And I think it just depends on your intent. Like if you want to use it for a craft, that's fine. If you want to use it as fine art, that's fine too. But I don't know that doing it a certain way makes it look like a certain thing. It, it all depends. My feeling is that this is a dictionary and I'm just giving you words right now. And later on, we're gonna make a lot of sentences <laughs> so we can figure out how to do this. Claudia says, I have no patience. Sometimes I'm in pain to finish the painting. I live for fast elements. Well, that's why I really encourage to people, listen, you don't have to work on one painting at a time. You can be working on a painting that is long-term, and then you can free yourself up with these just quick little exercises in between because it is nice to have a change of pace. All right. Oh dear, this is a really impressive mess. W315 says, what does quote expressive brushstrokes mean? What's the opposite of that? I guess my interpretation of an expressive brushstroke would probably be a brushstroke that is very visible, that you can see which way the brushstroke went. So here, I'll give you a demo. So if I do, for example, a brushstroke that's like that, I think for a lot of people, something like this feels more expressive. Whereas if I take my blue paint 
and I paint something like this, and actually I can use some of the matte medium to demonstrate this a little bit better. And there are so many blending techniques that you can do. So if I take some of the matte medium and I do something like this, clean my brush. And let's say I, I do some like glazing to like blend it like this. So let's make it blend to nothing. This is all matte medium, by the way. So this is like a very smooth gradient that I'm doing right now. Let's get all the way to nothing. Whoops, it's a little too much. <laughs> Okay, so does everybody see, to me, this brushstroke here feels expressive because it's very obvious which way I went to do that stroke. I obviously started here and went down. The rhythm is very visible. This is not. You look at this gradient and you don't really know which way my brushstroke went. Maybe it went side to side, maybe it went up to down. That's not as clear cut. I think it's good to know how to do both. Sometimes you are gonna wanna blend. Sometimes you are gonna to wanna to show your stroke. And so the important thing is that you can do both at the same time. E is asking, what kind of blue is that? This is Ultramarine Blue Series One from Utrecht. And I will be honest, <laughs> I bought these paints because they were the cheapest ones. <laughs> I was like, I can't get Series Four. <laughs> series Four paint is just, it's too expensive because again, it's like, I'm very frugal about my art supplies. <laughs> okay, so this is here, acrylic with matte medium. Jennifer says, learning the skills individually is a great method. It's like adding, adding to your quote, bag of tricks. Then as you're working on an art piece, you can apply the techniques that you want. Yeah, and I really do think from the way I paint, the success of an abstract painting that I would do would be very much based on variety of marks and also layering. That's a huge part of it. I really feel that understanding the difference between opaque paint and transparent paint, hugely important. If you miss that, you're missing out on like 50% of what you can do as an abstract painter. <laughs> Victor says, go crazy, Professor Lou, go messy. Oh yes, I have no trouble doing that. Vishaka is asking, won't your oil brush give a different effect than an acrylic brush? I believe they are mostly synthetic. Yes, they will. The oil brushes I have, I don't think this one's Winsor & Newton. This says Rhenish Filbert. Yeah, so this is an oil brush. And what I have seen with the acrylic brushes is they tend to be softer. The ones for oils are usually a little bit rough. I mean, it doesn't matter. If, if you like <laughs> the Filberts and they're made for oils and you use them for acrylics, like nobody cares. I think the more important thing though is you don't really wanna mix and match your oil and acrylic brushes. Because if you're painting an acrylic and there's residual oil paint, you're gonna get oil paint into your acrylic painting and then it's gonna eat away your acrylic painting because it doesn't have a primer on it to separate the oil from the acrylic. Dana says, I love using all kinds of mediums because it gives you many different ways to do a painting. Yeah, and sometimes in the heat of the moment, you're not really thinking about, oh, well, how do I get that? And so if you have, a chart that sort of says, oh, try this, try that, then it's faster. Poodle Lover says, some of my favorite textures are in watercolor. It's truly so expressive. Also, I'd like to see some textures using fabrics or lace. I got you covered, Poodle Lover. By the way, if you are enjoying this, would you like to see me do another stream like this, but with watercolor or with oils? Let me know, because I actually think this would be really fun to do a visual vocabulary stream 
for all the different materials that are out there. I mean, I could see myself doing this for sculpture, like showing all the different textures that you can do on sculpture. I mean, just for myself, <laughs> I mean, for you guys is great. Okay, so let's put this away. Speaking of fabric, let's get that started. So this is pantyhose for those of you young people. Pantyhose is what used to be very hip. It was meant to be worn so that it would make your legs look less blemished, I suppose. I don't think pantyhose is very in anymore. If you're under the age of 30, tell me in the chat, is pantyhose out of fashion? I think it is. I'm not sure. I don't wear it, but I know a lot of people do or did <laughs> rather. So it's the same thing where you can absolutely press things into the surface. Let's get back to some of that green. And you can also just use it the way you would use a rag or the way that you would maybe use a sponge. So I'm just going to write pantyhose dipped in acrylic. Okay, so let's just see what happens. I'm gonna do it with just straight ink. I'm not gonna put any water in it, at least in the beginning. I mean, it looks a lot like a sponge, although let's see if I, let's do more of like a printy thing. Like this. Actually, the only reason I own this pantyhose is because my daughter was making these puppets a little ways back and they're really good for making flesh toned puppets because they come in all different colors. Ooh, I kind of like that. Let me zoom in. Then you can all see a little bit better. I think I like that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my palette knife and I'm gonna like really try to press this texture. Yeah, it's very unpredictable. I mean, I don't know that you'd ever <laughs> be able to tell that this is what pantyhose would give you. But I think for a lot of people, the lack of predictability is exactly what makes it so much fun. Let's try it with a little bit of water. So I'm gonna take this little cup Maybe like dab some of this out. I mean, it's like a rag. You can do stuff like that. But I think the more fun thing is like pressing it. Oh, that is cool. Okay, it works much better with water. Let me zoom in so you can see the detail a little bit better. Okay, so that, that maybe is the key, is dip it in water and slosh it around like this. And then maybe I can like spread it. Ooh, that's cool. Okay, so there you can really see some of the texture that is specific to the pantyhose. Oh, I like that way better. Okay. Pantyhose plus acrylic and water. W1315 says, could we make a mark making wiki? Oh, that would be so fun. I just need to clone myself first. <laughs> we just don't have the money to hire staff right now. It's just too expensive. I would love to. I think it's an amazing idea. Ariel says, love to see one for watercolor and one for gouache. Certainly explains pantyhose is great for bank robbers. Hmm. Are you speaking from personal experience, certainly? <laughs> okay, so some people do still wear it. Gorgana says, I'm 22, wear it regularly when I wear skirts and dresses. Dana says they are out of fashion. Atta Girl says, now I can finally find a use for that drawer of pantyhose. I just have to ask because I, I don't trust myself <laughs> when it comes to is this hip or not? I, I always have to ask Lauren or something. <laughs> like I am not the person to be asking on fashion. Tom is asking, will you be doing a live stream of an abstract painting creation? Yes. Lauren and I are going to be doing that 
in May. We will have a follow-up where we're gonna take the techniques that I'm showing you today, we're gonna to actually apply them to making an abstract composition. Cause I'm not really composing right now, I'm just making marks. Okay. Okay, let's have fun with bathroom supplies. <laughs> Q-tips, they're awesome. <laughs> like, I feel like they're in CVS pharmacies for bath purposes. I'm like, dude, this is the best art supply. Like, I, I cannot believe these were not invented as art supplies. It's hilarious to me, okay? So let's just write here Q-tips. And I use these a lot for printmaking. It's really, really common because when you're wiping things, it's just very helpful. So I think the obvious one for a lot of people with a Q-tip is just the up and down dabbing like this. And of course you can change up the quantities. Like if you wanna make it really thick, you can do stuff like that. Although I do like the idea of working it out so that it becomes very, very light. Physical pressure is very important. Learn how to think about that. Because I think a lot of times when people paint, they're just painting. But I know that when I paint, I have to think very deliberately about, okay, how hard am I pressing? Am I barely touching the surface of the paper? Am I pressing super hard? And then of course you can take them to just make strokes like this. And you know what you guys will discover is that you'll notice that some of the marks that I'm making, some of them look the same. Like if I'm using Q-tips, I get this stroke, but I can also get the same stroke with this other tool. That's fine. Like I said before, a lot of it has to do with how it feels. Like does the Q-tip feel good to you as a tool? It doesn't really feel that good to me. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. I'm not, I'm not anything against Q-tips, but it's not really what I think is that exciting. But if you like the feel of a Q-tip, then do it. So let's actually try something else where I'm gonna put water here like that. And let me just take some straight acrylic and you can see it's not that wet, but I suppose I could go in with a wet Q-tip and make it bleed a little bit more like that. It looks like little comets. Or you can go in and just one that's already there. So I know a lot of people like to use Q-tips for blending. And I find it very handy just in general for watercolor and acrylic. Always have a paper towel nearby. So if you want to dab something, you want to get rid of it, it's a lot easier to do. Yeah, I don't like the way these feel. They're a little weird for me. Maybe some of you are big Q-tip fans. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to be nicer to my art supplies. I was so mean to Ross Sienna a couple straight, and I felt so bad. I was like, I'm sorry. I didn't appreciate you. <laughs> so now we gotta be careful. Although, <laughs> who here saw the short where Alex explained how toxic phthalo green was? I thought that was very accurate. I was like, you're right. Phthalo green, now I understand why we have problems. And why me and Prussian, I think me and Prussian Blue are done. I don't think we're going on another date. I think there are some red flags and I'm starting to think that that is not my cup of tea. I think I'm going to stick with burnt sienna because burnt sienna is just so warm and fuzzy. <laughs> Daniela says, I have to thank you. Ever since I found your channel, I've been binging your videos. I've learned so much. I'm now making more time for my pencil art instead of just painting. That's phenomenal. By the way, tell me in the chat, who here has discovered some other art supply that maybe you didn't know about or you didn't realize it had potential because you watched one of our streams? And did that help your practice? Did it help you see that medium in a different way? Because I don't think about myself as a sculptor at all. I do sculpture, but I'm not a sculptor with a capital S. And yet it informs my drawing practice, especially anatomy. I think sculpture really helps me figure out how to conceptualize three-dimensional form in a drawing context. Tom G says, I fluffed the end of the tip to make it fuzzier. Oh, that's really funny. Let me try that. 
So, oops, something like this. Oh, ooh, I think I pulled that out a little too much. <laughs> it looks like it's got a hairdo. Isn't that funny? I guess I shouldn't fluff it that much. Maybe I should just do like, like that. There, I feel like this is a little hair salon <laughs> for Q-tips. Let me see what happens. I'm very curious, Tom. I feel like, ooh, oh, that's strange. Oh, weird. Let me zoom out. It's, it's strange. I'm so glad you brought that up, Tom G. Let's try it. It's, it's like really, that's strange. Ew. <laughs> Oh, weird. I bet I could do that with the string, actually. Oh, that is bizarre. That is really fun. Thank you for the tip, Tom G. See, that's the other thing. I'm learning with all of you, okay? Pretty much every single stream, I'm demoing something, and there's always multiple comments. People say, oh, by the way, you can do this. Did you know that this is another way to solve that? So many of the solutions that I have found have come from those of you who come to the live streams and I'm learning with you at the same time. That's what makes it so fun. Lynn Russell says, Q-tips and groups tied together with twisty ties or a rubber band. Oh, that is so smart. Let's do that right now. <laughs> who else has a container full of rubber bands, SD cards and screwdrivers? I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me try that. That's so cool, Lynn. I don't have that many Q-tips with me right now, but let me just do the ones I have because I am very curious to see what that might look like. Okay, so let's do like a little Q-tip army. Put this in here. And actually, maybe I could like use them like this. Oh, that is so fun. <laughs> That's so cool, Lynn, I'm so excited. Let me just show you guys. Oh, that is so cool. Oh my God, I love it. That is like really, really awesome. Oh my God, I am a fan of Q-tips now. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Who else needs this stress release? I definitely do. <laughs> Tom G says, chains and necklaces give cool textures. Also applying paint and then applying the tool creates different textures as compared to using the tool to apply. Wonderful. Vitamin says, didn't necessarily discover new media, but made me rethink linoleum prints. That's just as important. I think sometimes we think we have lots of information or expertise in a certain area, but then we see one little thing that somebody says in a video, in a class or a workshop, and it just adds more to your tool bit. While Bertie says, you have any tips on how to start an art, uh, art YouTube channel, like how to approach it? I'm curious, tell me in the chat, how many of you here are thinking about an art YouTube channel? Maybe you have one, but you haven't really spent a lot of time on it. And how many of you are like on YouTube? doing tutorials all the time because I've been getting some questions about that. And if there is enough interest, I can certainly do a stream on YouTube tips for artists because, oh man, I have listened to so many videos to figure out YouTube. The way to think about YouTube, it's like a video game. <laughs> you have to find your Easter eggs and your gold coins. And did you know if you enter three, eight times, in this treasure chest, you're going to end up with a golden bunny. I mean, like, that's what YouTube is like. Okay. We also have pom-poms and you can use cotton balls. I mean, there's all kinds of makeup sponges, which are super fun. Just go to the pharmacy and just have a blast. You're going to love it. All right. Curious to know how these are going to go. And again, I think with a lot of these implements, it is better to take your palette knife and like spread a flat area like that, because then it is easier to get it in. So let's just see what the first, ooh, 
That's pretty satisfying. I mean, it's very similar to the sponge. It's not really that different. Although, you know what's kind of fun about stuff like this? When it's shaped a certain way, you can kind of push it around like you can do this. Well, that was not that successful, but <laughs> the point is you can use these. Oh, that was kind of a cool mark. Let me try that again. If I start down here and I, oh, that is really fun. Okay, I guess the pom-poms need, maybe I can, I wonder what happens if I dip it in water. Let's just see. That's kind of fun. That's good for blending, actually, kind of like that. And then maybe you could even take this and get it in there. Hmm, that's sort of fun. All right, let's try some cardboard. And the way I would describe this is it's basically like a little squeegee. You can use anything. It can be plexiglass, an old credit card. And what you just do is you dip it in like this. You can get really cool. I mean, oh, that feels good. <laughs> like, let me zoom out. something that's just straight like this. So what's cool about it is that it's not perfectly even. I happen to like those types of strokes. On the other hand, you can also do stuff like this. If you wanna just use the side of it, or if you wanna do strokes, I think I need more paint. You have to go through so much paint for these techniques. So what I sometimes do is I just scrape it around like this, so I build them enough paint. I mean, that is a really cool texture. Like that. And you can put things over each other. Like for example, let's say you have that, then you can go in. Ooh, I destroyed that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the point is, wow, there are some cool things you can do here with these cardboard pieces. JD Corgan says there are a million videos on how to start a YouTube channel, but I've never seen one specific to art. I don't think so because I've been all over YouTube trying to find information on it. And most of it is just YouTube. Most of it is not specific to art. Vitamin says, Last summer, I started YouTube out of boredom, gave up after a while, but I've been thinking a lot about coming back to it for a couple of reasons. The biggest problem, though, is I have no clue how to edit. You don't have to edit for YouTube. I mean, we don't edit much anymore because it's just time consuming. We're doing live streams pretty much all the time. I still have edited tutorials that I'm working on, but they take so long that I just can't do them all the time. I mean, I really only release them once every few months because they just take forever. Oh, good tip. Karen says, tree bark is fabulous for mark making. Actually, speaking of tree bark, I don't have tree bark, but I do have a tree branch. So let's do some of this. All right, how about let's go back to the green. All right. I just like this because it's an awkward tool. And if you just wanna shake things up, it's really unpredictable, the strokes that you make. Like you really just have no idea what's gonna come out of this. And you know what? Try different pacing. So like in here, if I wanna do like very short controlled strokes, or if I could just take like, look at that. <laughs> it's big like drippy blob of acrylic and I could just go Bleh. Like that's, that's kind of awesome <laughs> to do that. So yeah, th this is just really unpredictable. It's sort of like a caveman version of the bamboo reed pen. I've used these a lot on our ink wash tutorials and I like them because the line is not predictable. And the tree bark is sort of tree branch. 
is sort of similar. Like you could draw with this if you wanted to, but it does have a harshness to it that a lot of people don't expect to see. And if you use the paint very thick, you really can scratch into it. Let me zoom in so you can see that texture a little bit better. Does everybody see this? So in theory, if I put down a lot of paint like that and I press hard, like that already is really fun scraping and layering that you can get with the tree branch. I love that. Uh, Fuchsfarben says, please do the YouTube tips. Been dancing around the idea of doing videos for years now, but it seems so scary. It's not that it's scary. It's you have to be willing to learn. If you don't want to learn and make a lot of changes and you want everything to be perfect and curated, don't do YouTube. <laughs> You're going to go crazy. It's really, really hard. Poodle Lover is asking, what if you rip some paper, use the deviled edge, oh, deckled. I think you're saying deckled. Let me write that word in the chat. Deckled, because maybe not everybody knows deckled edges. Use the deckled edge for textures. You could also roll it and try it. Oh, yes. There's a lot of things you can do with that. Okay. Now, if you want to get really crazy, you can also get a funny looking branch. <laughs> I raided my front porch <laughs> this morning. <laughs> like you totally can use something like this where it's like, oh, I don't know what this is gonna look like. Because sometimes tools like this, like you, you sort of know about what it's gonna look like. That's fine. But it's like, look at this. You're like, you have no idea what's gonna come of this. <laughs> Let me just see. So again, what I would recommend like put this out flat. I know I'm making the red black, but okay. So I'm just gonna pick it up. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm not gonna draw, I'm gonna hit it. Let's just see. I mean, the one issue that I see here is that I'm getting a lot of tree branch gunk on my painting, which is maybe not a bad thing necessarily, but just know you are gonna make a mess. But it's like, why not? Vitamin says, I was never a big fan of abstract art, but for high school, I had to do an abstract piece. The teacher did a very surface level introduction, which wasn't enough for me to understand, did a lot of my own research and actually grew to rather enjoy the way it looks and appreciate it. That's great. Like oftentimes you just have to do it. Because I found that when I was an art school student, I made all kinds of assumptions about, oh, well, I don't need to learn that. That color technique is not useful, but it's like, I didn't even try it. Just give it a shot. It does not hurt you to do that. Daniela says, your videos are making me come at my materials from a different angle, even considering sculpture looks very therapeutic. I just don't know how I would do final steps from my home studio. We can do more sculpture tutorials. Sculpture is a lot trickier, I think, because it is hard to make archival work in sculpture because it's, supplies are just expensive. That's the difficulty. Okay. It's time to scratch. We have a lot of tools for that. I would say get out your plastic fork, get out your sculpture supplies if you happen to have them. Things like popsicle sticks are great, palette knives of all different sizes. You can raid the hardware store <laughs> and get a really scary looking scraper. Even things like my Hello Kitty comb. And like I said before, these ceramic supplies those are also great. So these I'm actually going to do on canvas because you'll see the result a lot better than you'll see it on paper. All right. I think let's do the fork first. I knew I had these plastic forks here for a reason. <laughs> they actually do have a purpose. 
That's why I think as an artist, it's hard to throw things away because you can't justify. And then it's like the one time you did throw something away and you need it, you just want to kick yourself. So what I oftentimes do with a fork, it's really fun to like really use pressure. And you can see that's very three-dimensional actually. Or, you know what else is really fun, is if you take your brush and you paint like a flat surface, this is something like this. And then you can take the fork and then you go in and you scratch away like that. I mean, there's no end. <laughs> of how far you can push scratching into the surface of paint. It's just very exciting. And you can build it up in different ways. For example, let me just paint this part up here. Actually, let me paint this whole side over again. And then you can really see the progression. So one thing that I do think about when I'm scraping is I do think about how much am I scraping. So like, for example, up here, I might wanna do something that's very clean and very controlled, but you could also do something like this, where there's so much scratching that you almost forget <laughs> that it was ever painted. And then of course there's everything in between. So the scraping is a great way to show that. And then just painting with the fork itself. I mean, it's harder. You have to really work with the paint. It doesn't really like to stick on the fork. But yeah, use the fork. It's a wonderful tool. Also, because we've had to get takeout to eat out because of the pandemic, I have so many extra forks and napkins now because... They just give it to you. I mean, we don't ask them to give us all that stuff. And so you just end up with all this stuff piling all over the place. It's like, I don't even want it, but I end up with a lot of it because of all the takeout stuff. Okay, now let's do the serrated knife, which is here. And this is really fun because it's a very different texture than the fork. Jeez, I really needed to prepare more brushes for this. Oh, well. Okay. And you do want your paint fairly thick. If it's too thin, you won't be able to see the texture very well. Okay, so let's try this. This is way more subtle. Does everybody see the texture is there, but it's nowhere near what we were getting for the fork? And so I do think the knife is better when you just apply it like this. And actually that's really fun. You can sort of use it like a palette knife or like this. I guess if you have a little bit less paint where you could go up and down. I mean, the one thing I will say when you're using a new material and you're playing around, don't be shy. Just wreck it. <laughs> That's the only way to really learn how to do this. Oh, that's actually really cool. Let me do that. You go up and down. All right, so I'm gonna write on the side here, plastic knife. Hachin is saying, just watch the Guangzhou video. Wonder where is Casey? Will he come back one day? Why he left art prof? Casey got a full-time job. He started teaching out of middle school and just couldn't do it anymore. I mean, a full-time teaching job is really, really a lot of work. Nicole says, this kind of abstract work is what I do as a palette cleanser. It's just nice to play, not overthink, trying to make, quote, meaningful art 
But usually in the end, I find even more meaning in the abstract. Yeah, that's a great way to keep things up and going. Mike says, this is making me wonder how many different techniques the Paleolithic cave painters used? Wow, the way art connects us to very ancient peoples. It's like it bends time and space. Very cool. I know, I really do feel like a cave person <laughs> right now doing all these really grungy supplies. <laughs> Okay, so there's the plastic knife. And what I have for you next is my Hello Kitty comb. I don't even know why I have this. I feel like maybe my parents gave it to my kids at some point. I don't know. All right, let's switch to green. My feeling is whatever works. That's great. Okay. I know a lot of people use combs for decorative papers. I, I've seen a lot of people do that and you can get really cool results. What I'm gonna do for this one, I'm gonna put actually like a glaze on top. Actually, I should have used matte medium, oops. Okay, here's the matte medium. I'm gonna do half of it with a glaze and the other half I'm just gonna do straight onto the canvas board. And then you can see what the difference is. Okay, because sometimes having that stuff behind can be very helpful. In fact, I might dab it, it's a little bit wet. Just so it doesn't interfere as much with the Hello Kitty comb. Okay, look at this. Ooh, that came out great. Yeah, because if you do it here, let me flip this around. If I just do straight paint like this, it comes out okay, but it's not the same as here where it's very visible. I mean, actually it's really good for doing strokes like that. Let me see if I can get one that's maybe with more thick paint. Yeah, I guess you would have to just really press down, but I like it with the glaze on top. I think it looks really cool. And then of course you can always scrape in all different directions. So that's really fun. The comb is just, it's great. Okay, now the other thing you can do is remember, it, it can be literally anything that you scrape into. So if I want to do a quick wipe, a little matte medium, a little bit of green. I mean, I'll tell you half the time, I'm just using the back of the brush to do something like this. So this scraping, it's whatever you want it to be. You can even do it, as I said before, with popsicle sticks. Make those kinds of strokes. I mean, I could just take the popsicle stick and just wipe it all away. Like that's really fine as well. But you'll notice now that it's fairly dry, it's not working out so well. So you do have to make sure it's fairly dry. But let me show you what you can do with sculpture tools. I just have so many tools lying around <laughs> that it's easy for me to just go in and start adding those. Okay, let's do a little bit of red. So I'm going to use the sculpture tools to scrape away. So like this one's very sharp. You can see that very visibly. This one's really, this is like a needle. I mean, that's like scratch board. Whereas this one is a lot thicker. And then even this one, if you look at it, it's like a loop tool. It's almost like a ribbon tool or something. It's really pretty. And then this is, I don't know, nondescript <laughs> sculpture tool. You can do that. So anything goes, you guys, in terms of all of this stuff. <laughs> Let's go back to 
this first panel. Okay, so it is dry. So now I wanna demonstrate to you how you would put a glaze on top of this, just for fun. Let's do complementary colors because it'll just make the glazing that much more obvious. All right, so if I take my brush, and again, I wanna use matte medium for this. Um, put a little bit here. Glazing, it's better to do it with matte medium. You don't have to, but I recommend it over water. Okay, so if you look at the matte medium, it makes the green transparent. So actually I should demo, well, I already did demo that earlier, actually. Yeah, so I don't need to demo it again. Okay, so it was earlier in the stream if you guys wanna find that. Okay, so you make it very, very thin. And now look at this. I can paint the green over the red. And you can see it's very clear cut layers because now you can still see the red. Nothing has happened to the red stroke, but the thing is the green glaze has adjusted that red just a little bit. And that's what you can do is you can shift the color with a glaze without disrupting what's happening underneath. Because if I took this straight green paint, has no matte medium in it and I do this, that's opaque green, that's over opaque red. And so therefore the green just covers it. Here it doesn't cover it because this is transparent glaze over an opaque area. Now, if you have the opposite, you could also in theory, if you wanted to, you could put a green glaze up here. And if you wanted to let that dry, and then eventually you could say, okay, well, I wanna put an opaque red on top I can do this because the opaque paint is pretty strong. You just put it on top. Okay, so that is now a glaze with opaque paint on top. So play with transparency, play with glazes because this is beautiful. Like sometimes you wanna keep that brushwork, but it's like, oh, it's a little bit not yellow enough. And so glazes are wonderful because you just tint it and you don't end up ruining things. I mean, I feel that glazing, Sometimes I feel like I'm cheating a little bit because <laughs> it's like, it's so easy. And yet it makes everything look so good. Bia says, in the end, deep down inside, artists are just little dragons hoarding art supplies as treasures. I would say that's an accurate description. Hello, awesome guy. First time on a live stream, welcome. Okay, let's move on. We're gonna do some 3D stuff. This is where it gets really fun. <laughs> we are going to do some, oh, you know what we need to do first? We didn't do palette knives. Okay, palette knives. Let me show you how to do that. The key thing about a palette knife we have a lot of videos on how to use them for mixing paint, but I don't think enough people use them for painting with. A lot of people just use it for mixing paint, but I really recommend that you watch my stream on doing palette knife paintings. It's a painting that's all palette knife, no brushes, and you learn a lot. There's something about a stroke like this. It's just so deliberate. You know, like with a brush, you can sort of fiddle around and fuss. You can't fuss with a palette knife. Like once you put down the stroke, that's kind of it. And there's also a bluntness to palette knives that I think is wonderful. There's a directness to it. And you can definitely build them up in different ways. I think the key issue I see is people are not aggressive enough. Like this is what I see. A lot of people, when they're painting with a palette knife, they just do this. It's sort of this like up and down, or sometimes it's something like this. It's like a side to side motion, but I don't think that's as helpful as just like going in with the palette knife. So let me get a smaller palette knife, 
which of course I can't find now. Oh, here it is. <laughs> and the shape pal knife that you use, totally personal taste. Has nothing to do with, oh, this one's better. No, whatever you think works best for you. So for a small one like this, you can see the strokes are quite different. And I just would say, if you haven't used a palette knife very much, scrape, like press, use, don't, don't do this like lame-o thing, you know, go, go in and really make strokes and marks and have fun with this. I mean, you should hear the palette knife making noises. If your palette knife is not making noises, you're not doing a good job. Okay. I just realized that could have been taken the wrong way. <laughs> Although everything I say could be taken the wrong way. <laughs> okay. All right. Now we're going to do the 3D stuff. Okay. So the first thing is you can have a lot of fun with all of these different tools in terms of what you can mix into them. I'm going to zoom out. So you can all see better. And actually, I'm going to take this away so I can have more mixing space. Let's start with this one. Coarse pumice gel. Never used this before. This is one of those art supplies. I'd always go into the art store and be like, oh, that looks so cool. And I would never have the guts to buy it or be able to justify <laughs> buying it, which is actually most of the time that's the case. So I'm like, do I really need that? Uh, it's all right if I don't have it. Okay, so the, the nice thing about this stuff, though, is this is where you can start to not use as much paint because this becomes the filler. So I think you'll find that with a lot of this stuff, you can really use a lot of the pumice and not have to use a lot of paint. Depends on what you want. But, oh, man, this is really satisfying. Look at that. Oh, it's so thick. Look at that. Do you guys hear that noise? I was not expecting that sound. Weird. Okay, so let me put, I'm just going to put in a little bit of red. I just want to see how far the red goes. It's actually, well, I don't know. I wasn't very good about cleaning my paint. So there's quite a bit of blue in here. But you can see a little bit of color went a long way. I feel like I'm about to plaster a wall or something. <laughs> this is great. Maybe we need an S ASMR channel <laughs> to demonstrate all these techniques. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's so strange. It felt better on the freezer paper palette. It felt very coarse here. Let me build it up, maybe over here. I mean, you can leave it that 3D. Let me hold it up so you can all see. I mean, there, there's shadows on this stuff and you can leave it like that. That's how dramatic a lot of these mediums are. Let's try some more of that. Like, let's just really cake it up. This. See what it looks like when it's very thin. Okay, that's like really satisfying. <laughs> I really, really like this. This is great. Lisa says, yesterday I saw a painting which looked like stucco. They must have used this material or something similar. Yeah, there's so many types. There's like modeling paste, all kinds of things that you can try. So this is the coarse pumice gel. I'm just going to write that up here. And by the way, you don't even need to do that necessarily. If you want, you can just do the paint out of the tube like this. I'm going to zoom in. For example, 
I could just take the red paint and just be like, bloop, and <laughs> that can be part of your painting. I made a Bouche de Noel for Christmas. Who here knows what I'm talking about? Bouche de Noel. It's basically a cake that's shaped like a log and you make these meringue mushrooms. This is exactly what they look like, except they're bigger. Or you can do stuff like that. Actually, you know what's really hilarious? You guys know the Art Prof logo, the little red blot? I can't believe this, but my kids remembered the day I was making that blot. I had this old tube of cadmium red hue oil and I just took out a sheet of Xerox paper and I just made red blobs <laughs> all over it because I needed to find just the right blob for our icon. So yeah, just paint with the tube itself. That's super fun. <laughs> All right, let's try another 3D version. This is glass bead gel, clear acrylic gel with small glass beads. Okay, I am very curious. <laughs> I'll have to see what this looks like. Oh, weird. Do you guys see? I, I thought the beads were gonna be like boba. Like I, I kept thinking boba tea, <laughs> but these are really small. These are tiny. Oh, I'm a little bit bummed out. I was hoping I was going to be painting with like boba tea acrylic paint. <laughs> okay, let's clean this palette knife. I really need a razor blade to clean this. This is really messy, but I don't have time to do that right now. Let's try the blue paint with the glass bead gel. Okay, we'll put some here. Oh, that's so weird. I feel like I like the pumice more. This is a little bit, it's weird. It's slippy. It's slippery. Like, do you guys see how when I do that with the palette knife, it's got a very different tone to it. Okay, let me get a little bit more. I think just having larger quantity. Weird. I don't know. I mean, it's all personal preference. Maybe I don't like it. Maybe you guys love it. It, it really depends. Okay, let's do some blue. I'm going to add again, just a little bit. Let's just see how far it goes. And I'll add more as I think is necessary. Wow, I'm surprised. Do you guys see? Like I put in so little paint and it, it really did turn blue. I mean, it's not as blue as the pigment, but th that's pretty substantial. So yeah, this is one of those things where if you want to just save your money in terms of all this stuff. That's probably a good idea. Okay, let me get a canvas board and running out of space here. Let me get, hmm. I do have some more freezer paper. This is the nice thing about freezer paper. You can just like stick it on top like a total barbarian. Or you can be like Alex Rowe, who told me that he's like, yeah, I'm just using a piece of bristle board. I'm like, Alex. <laughs> but I'm like, hey, works for you. That's great. In a pinch, this is way faster than cleaning. I mean, it is wasteful because you are wasting the freezer paper. But in a pinch, this is pretty handy. Okay, so let's put this here. All right, and again, this is the glass bead gel that I'm using. Let's try this. Oh, weird. You know what it is? It's, it's more slippery than the pumice gel. I don't know, it's not as dramatic. Like, I wanted boba tea. <laughs> this would make me a little sad. Although, look at that. That was sort of fun. Look at this. I feel like I'm making like a little wave. It doesn't do much. Like if when I try to do it thin, not a lot happens there. This is something, I think this would be better if you like really want to go 3D because this here that I'm doing, which is very thin, I, I don't see, ugh, I don't really like that very much. 
This is much better. Okay, let's just scrape the rest of this on. And then again, it's like stucco. I mean, you can just take this and just strokes like that. It's pretty cool. Out of girl is asking, are the gloss beads round? I think, I mean, they're so small that I don't even feel like it's beads. I feel like beads is not a great description. I feel like it's more like sand than it is a bead. Oh, this is a good tip. Terry says, when the glass bead gel dries down, the beads are way more visible. Okay, cool. So we'll take a look at those once they've dried and see what that looks like. All right, let's take a look at another one. The other one that I have available is Heavy Gel Matte. Now, again, you can get this in gloss. You can get it in satin. They have so many different versions. You just have to figure out which one is the best for your purpose. So let's do, let me just clean off the glass bead stuff up here. And let's try some alizarin crimson. <laughs> Especially because this is goopier. This is the student grade one. I'm just curious to see how it's going to work with the heavy gel mat. Okay, so let's put in. Ooh, okay, that is really creamy, guys. Look at that. Oh, oh, this is very 3D. That is nice. What does that feel like? It's um, I don't know what this feels like. Silky frosting, maybe. That's what it feels like. All right. I'm going to put a little drop of the lizard crimson in there. Again, let's see how far that goes. And up to you how much you want to do, especially when you're painting 3D like this. Oh, man. The art supplies are just eaten so quickly. I feel like I would want it a little bit thicker, but I don't know. It's personal preference, I think but it's very smooth. That That is one thing I will say. Okay, so let's try a big blob first just to get started. Yeah, this one has, it doesn't have any texture. It's very smooth, but you, you can get pretty 3D with this. I mean, that's fairly substantial. And when I make it very thin, it really is thin. So this is really great. This is sort of like giving your acrylic paint steroids, <laughs> something like that. It is quite different. See, I'm one of those people, I'm very jealous of people who can do stuff like this. Like I can demo it fine, but like actually putting it into artwork is very hard for me. Lauren Welsh will be very good at it. So that's why she's doing the draw along. Yeah, I like that stuff. Christine says, I'm an art instructor and old faux finisher. I use polyurethane from paint stores or from a faux finishing company called Faux Effects. Thank you so much for that information. I mean, that's a whole world of skill that I don't have. But yeah, there's so much you can learn about that and handmade papers. It's really fun. Poodle Lover says, it looks like room temperature butter that has been beaten into a smooth consistency. That's close. It's not quite as hard. It's a little bit softer than room temperature butter. Atta Girl says, do you know if when these gels dry, the color brightens, the pastel nature is killing it for me? I don't know. Let's wait for them to dry and I'll post them in the Discord in a couple days so everybody can see that. Good tip from B Dog Boos, who says, try adding a few more layers of gesso to the canvas. It'll soak up less paint. Great tip. Thank you so much, B Dog Boos. M 
Muiz says, which is the better for using under oils, gloss or matte? It just depends on your personal preference. I mean, I would say in general, everything we talk about here, most of the time, the answer is it depends on what you want. There, there's nothing in art that is inherently bad or inherently good. It just depends on how you're actually using that. Okay, now we're gonna have some fun <laughs> with coffee grounds. <laughs> this is from Lauren. I'm not taking any credit for this, but it's such a smart move. And if you are really frugal, Lauren told me, ooh, look at that. Lauren told me that she makes coffee, what the coffee grounds, saves them, lets them dry out, and then she adds them to her paint. I was like, wow, this is dedication. I was lazy. I did not use these coffee grounds. <laughs> I just ground them up. But she said that it's a really good way to boost your paint and give it a cool texture. And I'm curious if I'm going to like this better than the pumice gel because the pumice gel, it's pretty even. The only thing with the coffee ground, it doesn't have the body because it's just the coffee grounds. And so you do need to use a lot of paint to make this work. So let me just, I'm gonna just start with a little sprinkling first and let's just see how far that goes. Oh, I need a lot more paint. Yeah, this is if you wanna just say goodbye <laughs> to all your acrylic paint, this is the technique, but it's so cool. And by the way, if you have not seen Lauren's mixed media acrylic painting tutorial. This is one that we shot many, many years ago in the studio, but she demonstrates all kinds of really fun acrylic painting techniques, including the one that I'm showing you right now. Okay, I'm gonna mix up different variations. Okay, because this one still has quite a bit of paint in it, but let me take a little slice of it, move it down and let's add way more. Because in her tutorial, the way she mixed it, it almost doesn't even look like paint. It looks more like dirt, which is what I'm getting now. So you can play with how much coffee to acrylic paint you want. I mean, I sort of like that idea better because it's like, then I have control over how thick I want it to be. Whereas with the coarse pumice gel, I'm just using it out of the can. So this is kind of nice. You can't do this with oils though. If you try to do this with oils, the oil will probably eat the coffee ground. So this is definitely an acrylic technique. This is not for oils. Oh, wow, that is like really thick. Look at that. Cool. Okay. So let's start with the medium one, which is up here. That's pretty nice. I like that. I'm gonna do another one. Let's let's put a little bit more in here because I feel like the leap between these two is very, very dramatic. And I, I could do one that's in between just to see what the difference is. And it does darken the color because the more coffee grounds that are in here, the darker the color seems to be getting. Okay, and now here's the one that has like, a look at that. <laughs> I can just like, Pick it up, it's so 3D. And I'm gonna guess this works better when there's acrylic under so it will actually stick. So probably you don't wanna just put it straight on like I did. That is really fun. Here, look at this. I mean, if I show you the side, I could probably build it up even more. Let me see how far I can go without it like totally falling apart. There, I'm making a little, a little lava mound. See that? It's pretty three dimensional. Cool. All right, so we're gonna write coffee grounds. And We've got a couple other things you can do as well. We have to do the pastry bag. <laughs> pastry bag is really fun. <laughs> and the bread fairy, my mother-in-law, 
you don't know who that is. We call her the bread fairy because she likes to deliver treats to our house, which I have no problem with. She used to work at a bakery professionally. And so she has made all kinds of cakes and just made these incredible cakes for her kids. She made a cake that was an eyeball. She made one that was a compost bin. And my kids now have this expectation that they're going to get this immense work of art <laughs> for their <laughs> birthdays because he sort of continued the tradition of making absurdly complex birthday cakes. Actually, the funny thing is my kids are so different. So one of my kids was like really into warrior cats. Tell me if you know warrior cats. <laughs> I miss warrior cats. It's not my generation, but she was really into those warrior cat books. And so she said, okay, I want a cake that's warrior cats on it. My other daughter says, I want you to make me Tataris and I want Hades to be in the middle. <laughs> it's like really, really funny. Okay. We're literally going to use pastry decorating bags. These are disposable. They're small. You don't have to get a big one. And so what you do, and I know there's probably somebody in here who's a baker, who's probably horrified by the way I'm doing this. So I'm sorry, I, I'm not a baker. But what you can do is just stick this stuff in there. Actually, I'm going to add more because I feel like I'm going to regret it. <laughs> I do that a lot, actually, whenever I have piped something. There's like never enough frosting. I'm sure professional bakers don't have this problem, but I definitely do because <laughs> I'm not a professional. Oh my gosh, this is so much. I feel like I'm mixing taffy. <laughs> this feels more like a food demo than it does an art demo. All right. <laughs> Let's try this. All right. Let's see. Oh, wow. People are really fans of the bread fairy. The three-legged cup. Yep, I showed that on my Instagram. It's just a little quirky thing that I just love. Emmanuel says, is she from the U.S.? She is from the U.S. Don't know how many generations back. I know her parents were from the U.S. So, yeah, I don't really know. Okay, so now what I want to do is... I mean, this is the part that's a little bit tricky is you have to take the big blob of paint and stick it in like this. <laughs> I'm sure I'm doing this wrong, bakers. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I look like a Neanderthal. Okay, let's scoop that in as far down as I can get it. Okay, so now what you do is you just like push it down. Oh wait, but I didn't cut the thing at the end. So typically speaking, if you were a real baker, which I am not, you would have like a cap and a thing. I mean, you don't, you could do that for acrylic paint. I don't really feel like ruining my pastry things. So I'm not going to do that, but you can in theory do that. I just need to find my scissors. I do think it's better to cut it too small than too big at first, because if it's too small, you can always cut it bigger. Okay, so now, press this all the way down. Like that. Let's just pull that. Let's do the piping. Okay. So now what you do, this is what I do. Again, I, I am not a <laughs> baker at all. All right, zoom in a little bit more. All right, ready? Let's see <laughs> the piping. Okay, that is really fun. How cool is that? <laughs> awesome. Okay, so now I got to twist it. And you can do things like this. Or let's see, what else could I do? I could do like a ring. Something like that. Another good hack from JD who says you can also use a Ziploc bag. Just cut the corner to go to a cheaper route than buying pastry supplies. Yeah, except with the bread fairy, she takes me to all these 
kitchen places. It's really awesome. C. Cantrell says you can roll a paper cone, trim the end, or a plastic baggie too. Awesome. I agree, Dan. 75% of art is looking like an idiot. Yeah, you have to be willing to do that. <laughs> okay, so let me do some more. How about... Or sometimes it's fun to do like a, I mean, I don't know if that's going to stay. It's probably going to like flop down. I don't know. Maybe, it will. oh, there it goes. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I mean, I think what could be fun here too is like overlapping things. So if you want to like build something up like this, you can also put something over like that. I mean, I bet there are so many other techniques that I am not knowing <laughs> right now. But the point is the, the world is your oyster. <laughs> when you've got a pastry bag full of acrylic paint. I mean, I've seen Lauren do things where she'll just like pipe on top of the piping like this. <laughs> So you really are like building a sculpture. Oh, that was really satisfying. <laughs> Let me zoom in a little bit more. All right. And then the other cool thing that is fun, I mean, I'm not gonna obviously do a full out painting right now, but in theory, what you can end up doing is the, the whole layering thing. That's really the whole point of all this. So for example, if I take some blue, let, let's actually do a gradient. So I'll do like um, dark blue up here and then I'll get some matte medium so I can do a gradient like this. Maybe I'll just lift here. All right. Let's really build that up. So this way you can see a little bit of layering. Even though we're not doing a full up painting today, I still want you to see the difference. Okay, so look at this. Oh, I'm almost out. Let's just see how much I can do. I mean, it's so different when you look at it here and you look at it here. Oh, you guys, I'm so bad at this. <laughs> My husband is the one who's good at the pastry piping. I am not the one, so I, I'm not a good example, but... Come on, don't you guys want to make something out of acrylic now? This is kind of awesome. <laughs> All right, and then I would also say, let me show you guys just briefly a couple of stencil-y things you can do. So for example, and this is where it really is helpful to have a couple colors. What I recommend is if you want to do like, let's just say a light wash with the matte medium. I mean, this is also something, again, that you can do with the jelly plates that I demoed the other day. But it's also an option. I, I just feel like I don't see a lot of painters using stencils. And I'm like, you guys, it's so easy. <laughs> and you get such great results. I'm just a big fan of mixing the painting and printmaking processes. So for example, I mean, you can use anything for a stencil. It could be a sheet of acetate. I just happen to have lying around some Yupo paper, which is heavy. You don't have to use Yupo, but I just happen to have it. <laughs> I mean, that's most of the time, that's the reason why I do things. It's not because it's the best choice. It's because I happen to have it lying around. So what you can do, 
you can just cut different shapes like this. If you wanted to, you could also use an X-Acto knife. That's also fine. That. And I like getting into all that negative shape stuff. Okay. And so now, if you want to put that on top, and you can paint the red over that, this gets really fun. Cleaning my brushes. Wow, I think I'm going to be cleaning <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Let's just do some stippling. So you can take this. And this, again, this is also going to be somewhat like a glaze. Let's do this one like really thick and opaque. And then you can see what the difference is. So this is very thick on this side. And let's say on this side, let me make it very thin. So I'm just going to do more matte medium. Actually, that's too much paint. Water that down. More matte medium. Let's just spread it. Yeah, anything goes for a stencil. You don't have to have anything special in terms of the paper for the stencil. Okay. All right, and I do, I wanna build this up just a little bit more because I can see that the blue is showing a little bit too much. Okay, so check this out. Isn't that fun? <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I mean, this a lot of what I'm showing you today is printmaking, but you can see, you can put this pretty much into any context. And then there's always the one that, is so popular on Instagram, and I get why, but it's like, is it, do you really need to see another video? I'm sorry, if you guys like those tape videos, I'm not trying to insult you. <laughs> I'm just saying, I cannot believe how popular those tape videos are. <laughs> Let's just do one here. Um. <coughs> So you can see the paint peel, peeling just, ah, just like that. And you can do this forever. Let this dry, do another thing, just layer and layer and layer. It's super, super fun. I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord in the Art Alongs channel. I would love for all of you to join me there for a post live stream chat. Subscribe to the Art Prof YouTube channel so you can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And I want to give a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters for giving us the materials and financial resources that we need to keep Art Prof up and available for everybody without a paywall to make art education accessible. So everybody, thank you so much for watching and hanging out with me. I'll see you next time.